He says this, what has changed in the discussion of using the Trinity in evangelistic presentations compared to 10 years ago? Good question, because I've been doing 321 with people for uh, over 10 years now. So it was, it was first a blog post back in 2010, and then there was like a video that came out in 2012, and a course came out in 2013, the book came out in 2014, the first book. And so I've been talking about Trinity for at least these, these last 10 years and foregrounding Trinity in evangelism. And I think 10 years ago, in fact, I remember a, a conference up in London and Mike Reeves, a great theologian of the Trinity, uh, sort of spoke and was trying to enthuse a whole bunch of, tr of evangelists mm -hmm. that it's really important to talk about Father, Son and Spirit because it might be helpful to name who the living God is. Um, was he promoting the good God at the time? He might have been, yes. Yeah. So that's a book I often recommend to people. It's a fantastic book, on, a the book on the Trinity. If people, if people want a great book on the Trinity that gets you in to a deep doctrine in about 100 pages, the good God, you can't do better than that. It's a book like no other, really, I would say. It's, I it's, think Karen <laughs> Swallow Pride should actually <laughs> trademark that sentence because <laughs> that's going to get put in every commendation now. <laughs> And um, at that conference, he was challenging a whole bunch of evangelists to be more Trinitarian explicitly in mm -hmm. how they um, proclaim the gospel. And then we sort of broke up into groups afterwards, and we tried to apply what Mike Reeves sort of said, and nobody knew what to do. It was, it was like there were tumbleweed kind of blowing through right. the room as people. One person sort of said, oh, I kind of talk about how God's like a heavenly group hug in the sky, and you might want to join the heavenly group hug sort of thing, and, and you know... Uh, nobody really had right. much of a much of an angle on being trinitarian whereas like what mike was saying and what 321 is trying to do is that if you put jesus front and center in your evangelism mm -hmm. then you are trinitarian because he's the christ the son of god christ means he's filled with the spirit son of god means he's the son of the father right. so it's all about jesus identity and from a a, a relentless jesus focus you then are encountering a God who is constitutionally love. And at that point, everything kind of un unlocks because ultimate reality is love. And you've got an explanation for why is the greatest thing love? Why do mm -hmm. people feel mm -hmm. like the greatest thing is love? Well, because yeah. love's not the greatest thing, but the greatest thing, God, is love. And that starts to be very uh, have a great explanatory power for people. And I think there's much more people thinking in those terms and speaking in those terms and explicitly speaking of Christ, the Son of the Father, in their evangelism rather than just God in the abstract. I think I think we've come along uh, quite some distance in the last yeah. 10 years. And yeah, happy for 321 to be part of that journey. So the way you are evangelistic, or sorry, Trinitarian mm. in your evangelism is that you're relentlessly focused on Jesus. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So here's a little question. When people probably would have said for a while that they have been preaching Jesus. Okay, we preach Christ. Okay. Right. Um, how are those presentations of Jesus maybe not as Trinitarian as they ought to have been? And how does 321 try to help people to yeah. see him as, you say, the Son of the Father? If you start with a God who is defined in the absence of Jesus, mm -hmm. and then you bring in Jesus you start to have a problem. Either Jesus kind of dissolves into the great God that you began with that didn't mm -hmm. include Jesus and that there's God and then there's sort of Jesus. Um, and, and at that point, he kind of like ascends into the Godness and kind of dissolves and all the crunchiness of Jesus, the Son of the Father filled with the Spirit yep. kind of disappears. Or he descends beneath God <clears throat> and he is someone who is other than God and less than God's at which point you're a sort of a heretic that's called an Aryan, yeah. and, and that's one to avoid. And, and so if you start with a doctrine of God that is Christless, you can't really... Ins and, and then however much you kind of jump up and down and say, Jesus is really, 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 mm -hmm. really, really important. If you've defined God in the absence of Jesus to begin with, then you're, def you're, you're jumping up and down about a Jesus who is not God or who right. is outside of God, or who is less than God. Or you're jumping up and down about a Jesus who simply is the God that you defined in the beginning, but the God you defined in the beginning is just a single person. And that's a heresy yeah. called modalism, one to avoid. And so that's a problem. These Trinitarian heresies are quite, uh, they're mm -hmm. quite easy to, for people to fall into, especially yeah. when people try and illustrate the point. Right. right. The illustrations often, often fall down. 
uh, as St. Patrick found uh, <laughs> when he went on Lutheran Satire yes. YouTube channel. Man, he was slayed um, by... Yeah. yeah. He didn't come back from that one. He absolutely didn't. Yeah. Um, let's move on to another question. So we thought about Trinitarian evangelism. We've done the three, if you like. Mm-hmm. I've got a question which is potentially more of a two sort of question. Yes. Let's see how you think this is a okay. a two sort of question. So uh, this question, again, was submitted uh, a couple of days ago by someone called Heled, or if I'm right, hmm. those Ds are supposed to be pronounced as the. Heled. Yeah. And it's Welsh. Yes. Heled. I would have thought so, yeah. Right. How is it fair that we're <laughs> born into a... W- see, turns out she was <laughs> Welsh. Sorry, Heled. <laughs> Go on. You've, no, you've started, the whole so you'll thing. finish. I do the, I will. All right, I'll do the whole thing and I'll do it again properly. How is it fair properly? that we're born into a world with original sin? Yeah. We have no choice in the matter but to be fundamentally sinful. Now, <laughs> the question then is, okay. if we're born into original sin yes. and we can't help it, how is that possibly fair? Yeah. And really, I have a strong instinct of answering this question by saying, well, life's not fair. But with Jesus, you get something that is better than fair. And I, and I think actually the doctrine of original sin is, it needs to be cast in the context of the two Adams. That yes, in the first Adam, we have gone down with him into sin and death mm-hmm. and we're under curse and we're born into that state. And there's a great danger in kind of stopping the story there. And then saying, well, how is that fair? And in a sense, that's not fair at yeah. all, right? Yeah. Um, but the story is only half done. The story then goes on. Christ, the second Adam, comes and takes all that sin and curse on himself, rises up again, so that just as you were one with Adam, now you can be one with, with Jesus, and you share in all his blessings. And so at that point, mm. fairness is not really the category to think about in, in terms of that story. Mm. It's a story that you are kind of carried along in and you find yourself swept up in the Adam story and then you find yourself swept up in the Jesus story. And at the end of the story, it's better than fair, far better than fair. And you get far better Mm. than your just desserts. I also want to say it is what life is like because I find myself in this world and physically speaking, I share in Adam's kind of life, don't I? Mm -hmm. Physically speaking, I'm perishing. Mm. And if you were to map my genome, you'd find all sorts of gene deletions and you'd find some ticking time bombs health-wise. And that's Speak why I don't want to... Speak for yourself. <laughs> Pristine. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but I'm, like, that's, that's why I don't want to map my genome. Like, I don't, I don't want to know, like, what the ticking Was time bombs are. Was anyone offered? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think it costs quite a bit of money. Yeah, yeah. But, right. but, like, do you want to know all the things that probably will kill mm-hmm. you? Um, You've got that issue, I've got that issue, we've all got that issue physically, and the Bible is just holistic enough to say, and that's true spiritually and morally too. Right. That I've got some ticking time bombs. Yeah. That, and, and just as you might have a predisposition towards kidney failure, and I've got a predisposition towards heart failure, mm-hmm. so you might have a predisposition towards pride, and I've got a predisposition towards greed, or whatever it mm-hmm. is. Um, and it's, it's, it's as holistic as that to say that we're all in the same boat. We all have different kinds of sins, different kinds of expressions yeah. of this dysfunction that we're born into. And that's, that is just life. You yeah. know? And we're not born neutral in a medical sense and we're not born neutral in a moral sense either. But here's, here's the good news. Like I, I often tell my, the, the story of my ancestor, Anne Forbes. Like She was sentenced to death uh, back in 1786 for stealing 10 yards of printed cotton from a London market. And then her sentence was commuted from, from death to life transportation to Australia, which was considered a, a fate worse than death at, at, the, at the time. Convict Island. Convict That's Island. It. Yeah. And therefore, why was I born on Convict Island? Like, I didn't do anything. How yeah. is that fair? Um, you know... And you might, you might think, oh, and now the story is I was born on Convict Island and I need to get back to the mother yeah. country and I need to scrimp and save and earn and make my own passage yeah. back to Blighty. And is that, is that the story? And some people cast the original sin story as like that. You're like, we're born in Adam and we're full of all these kind of genetic and moral like, yeah. failures. How is it fair that I now need to earn my way with God? I, no, you don't. 
Because the Jesus story is not that we have been exiled like to a spiritual Australia and we have to make our way back to Britain. The story is the king exiles the criminal and then emigrates and then right. makes his own palace and home in yeah. Australia. Such that if you really want to run away from the king, you can run away to the desert if you like. But you are born into exactly the condition that the king will meet yeah. you in. And we are born into sin. And the good news is Jesus says, I'm, I'm the spiritual doctor for the six sinners that you are. And so we are born, when we are born into this sinful condition, we are born qualified for the Savior. Right. Just as your sin doesn't disqualify you for the doctor, it qualifies you for the doctor. So actually the sinful condition we're born into doesn't disqualify us yeah. from the gracious Jesus who saves us. It actually qualifies us. So is it fair? It's, it's actually far, far better than fair. So two things I just want to come back on that. Just to say, if you are on the ahaslides.com uh, page, thank you so much. It's great to have some questions going in there. You'll know that you can also upvote uh, different questions as well. So uh, that would be really handy for you to do, just so that we can see, uh, we've got a bit more of an idea of, of which questions people really want to have uh, answered. So let me come on to back to that point on... Um, so you're you're there in Australia. Are you supposed to just try and swim back? Is mm. that the gospel? Mm. Um, I, was it? I think it was a Christopher Hitchens issue because he said, "I'm born sick, commanded to be well." Right, and that was supposed to be back in the New Atheist time. Yeah. That was like, "Whoa, then you can't come back from that yeah. because yeah. he just said he just got you on biblical thinking. You're born in Adam, and you're told you have to be good enough." Right. And so how is so, so you're saying the gospel is no you're not told be well mm. you are given the one who makes you well you're asked yeah. to receive yeah yeah you're given the doctor you're and, given the and doctor that healthcare given, is free at the point of okay. access you know? like it's, <laughs> and and the Christopher Hitchens caricature yeah. born sick commanded to be well yeah. is an Adam and Moses story yeah. right Moses the the giver of the law the ten yeah. commandments as though yes we're born into sin and then we've got to earn it back by being mm. good boys and girls that would be an Adam and Moses story the Christian story and the two of three two one is an Adam and Jesus story born in Adam and therefore we are born exactly in the place where Christ meets us just as the king might emigrate to Australia and make that his kingdom mm -hmm. so Christ has entered into our condition as the second Adam so that we're born into precisely the place yeah. where Jesus meets us and the, the second follow-up on that is when we're thinking about this idea of inheritance the mm -hmm. idea that you inherit all these various conditions medically and things and so the bible's holistic and says well you've also inherited your sinful nature mm. it do you think part of our the reason why we ask that question that hell had asked which is about is it you know sort of fair because we are so disconnected from our ancestry or our, our, our unity as a human race yes that we're all totally convinced that we're isolated individuals right. with our own right. individual will and story and right. need to express ourselves is that do right. you think this is a peculiarly western yeah question western post-christian question because right. I, I think you know thinking about my book from 2022 the air we breathe that that the west has been so christianized that the the notions that we tend to have even if we don't think of ourselves as christian are, are particularly christian and christianity has sort of invented the individual um and it's a very good thing to to think that i i don't get lost in the shuffle of a collective mm -hmm. humanity um, I have my own rights and my own dignity and my own worth, and, and isn't that a wonderful thing? But the problem in a post-Christian society is detached from the Jesus story, that becomes a very individualistic way of thinking about myself. And I'm just this atomized person all by myself. And I want to consider myself um, purely by myself. And, and that's not just a social truth. We also think that mm -hmm. way when it comes to God. And no man is an island, you know, and, mm -hmm. and the, the biblical teaching is, is a much more rounded picture of who we are. And we are our families. And we, we kind of know that, you know, yeah. I, I was in, the, in a restaurant when I was in Australia over, over Christmas and I made a, a stupid joke to the waitress. And, and I just thought, that's my dad. My, my dad right, just okay. said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I open my mouth, my dad comes out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> it's happening, you know, and our families. Well, I'll just stop there. I open my mouth, my dad comes out. I mean, that's, yeah. that's pretty... 
It's that next video, isn't it? That's a pretty <laughs> oh, right, Trinitarian yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. Mm. Oh, that's what the waitress said. <laughs> <laughs> no, she didn't. She was looking at you and she was saying that. Um, yeah. I think we've completely resolved that question. I'm awesome. going to mark it as answered and Answers. I'm going to move Helen, to. If you've got any issues with Nate's <laughs> accent, um, please do write to info at Spickland. We'll go for a frothy coffee next mm-hmm. time I'm in South Wales. Yeah. Um, here's a question. Mm. Here's one from someone called Boydy or Boy Die. It could be boy die. <laughs> could be, yeah. It's a bit aggressive. But anyway, uh, Boyd <laughs> Welsh, asks, again. Yeah. could be Welsh again, is it okay to say I'm really proud of what I've achieved mm. and that kind of thing? People say it regularly and it always grates because I was brought up good old Calvinistic ways, okay? Mm. So the idea, so we talked about this idea of being in Adam and being in Christ, mm-hmm. but then... Is there a point to which we've lost the individual mm. in in this kind of you know sort of federal thinking? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so interesting that in um, Romans, the same in the same book that Paul writes to the Romans, he'll say things like in Romans chapter three, there is no one who does good, not even one. <coughs> mm-hmm. But then as he explains the gospel and he gets the end of Romans and he gets to like Romans 15 and he says, I'm convinced that you guys are full of goodness. No, like, oh, come on, which is it? Like, yeah, can, yeah. You, can you do no good whatsoever? Yeah. Or can we be full of goodness? And Paul in the very same letter, I mean, he, he would have sat down and like he, he yeah. wrote <laughs> or he spoke out and the, the, the dictator, the amanuensis, the person writing down what he said, um, is writing down what he's saying within... A matter of minutes of one another. No yeah. one can do any good. I'm I'm convinced that you guys are, are full of goodness. And the Bible's always doing this in terms of the vertical and the horizontal. Okay. As regards the vertical, um, what could I ever give to God that He hasn't already given to me? Which is what Romans 11 says, right? Everything mm-hmm. that we we ever do has come from God. So whatever you offer to God, it's never you climbing the ladder towards Him. Because he gave you that thing in the first place. Um, all things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you, David, praise. One of your the, favorite uh, verses. Yeah, one of the favorites about the uh, building of the temple. Yeah, yeah. And so um, as we give, it's it's not, we don't earn a wage. And again, and again Romans chapter 6, you know, the mm-hmm. wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Like our sinful ways are all about earning, but you can never earn with God. You can only ever receive a gift. Yeah. So like vertically speaking, um, yeah, we could never, we could never be proud. And again, Romans four goes into this, like, um, when it talks about, uh, Abraham and, and he could be proud of certain things, but never before God. Yeah. Because there are things on the horizontal level, um, that we can do and we can pass on the gift of God to others. And actually Paul is able to identify in Christians. Ah, oh, it was it was great the way that you shared in the ministry of giving with me, and it was great the way that you poured yourself out in service in the gospel. And so he can identify goodness in people. In Philippians chapter two, um, he says, "I plan to send Timothy to you very soon, so he can bring back all the news." Um, uh, and and he says Timothy is loyal and genuinely concerned for for you. Most people around here. Oh, this this is a very funny translation. The message translation, <laughs> um, NIV. Um, I have no one else like Timothy who will show genuine concern for your welfare. Everyone else looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. So he's able to identify like the goodness within people. Mm -hmm. Jesus and Nathaniel, he is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. Jesus is able to say that to to Nathaniel in in John chapter 1. In John chapter 2, it says like he would never entrust himself to a man because he knows what's inside a man. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. again, in that, in that vertical sense, um, we can never earn it with God, but in, in a horizontal sense, we can acknowledge that the, that there is goodness in people Mm -hmm. and you can even acknowledge that in yourself. Right. And so p- specific to Boydie's question, I'm really proud of what I've achieved. Mm. That's okay to say because whilst we are never going to be capable of achieving what is re- required of us before the Lord by ourselves, mm-hmm. that we can tell when we've done a good job or we, we yeah. know when we've... It's a funny one, like the word pride. 
um, just has quite a semantic range. And, and mm. one of the meanings is, oh gosh, isn't that one of the deadly sins? In fact, isn't that the chief of the deadly sins? <laughs> the mother of all it's sins. Like, right, is, yeah, yeah. Is, is, is pride and that sort of self-regard. Yeah. But I think in English, pride is also kind of the opposite of being ashamed. You know, mm -hmm. walking around with your head held high rather than walking around with your, your, your face downcast. Yeah. And Christians are meant to walk around unashamed. Like we are meant to be unashamed with our head held high. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there, there's sometimes when you can be proud in that sense of a job well done. And there will come a time when Jesus will say to people, well done, good and faithful servants. And I think by the Spirit, we can kind of enjoy his good pleasure in the things that we've done. Mm -hmm. um, yes, that can kind of edge into pride in that negative sense. And you might want to watch that. And maybe you prefer not to use the language, I'm really proud of myself for doing that. Um, but you could, you could say, I, I feel really blessed by God. I'm really pleased with what happened. I'm, I'm glad that I, w I got to do that. I think I did a good job, mm -hmm. actually. And I got great pleasure out of that. Yeah. All praise to God. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, to put it in another way, we might say of, you know, uh, children, I'm proud of you of in doing this. There's a way yeah. you actually something people need to hear. They yeah. need to sort of hear that they they can contribute. Yeah. Um, yeah. In some way, they're not contributing to their eternal salvation. They cannot yeah. do anything. Yeah. But certainly, as as re as goes, um, people's understanding of themselves as an agent in the world. Yeah. They need to recognize that they have capacity yeah and and i think there would be a faithless way of saying oh i haven't been given i'm not gifted i'm not gifted like that would be a faithless thing to mm -hmm. say if god has actually given you like like yeah. i've just given my children gifts at christmas <laughs> like yeah. oh i'm not gifted how dare you <laughs> like, like, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I spent money on this gift <laughs> like like yeah. and god has given you things and, and and there's a way of owning that and celebrating yeah. that and there's a blessed self-forgetfulness to use the the title of a, a famous tim keller sermon you can you can be so released from the gospel that actually my ego is not caught up with whether I did a good job or not, mm -hmm. and my ego is is taken out of it because I was crucified with Christ and it's only Christ's righteousness that really counts at the end of the day. But therefore, I can just enjoy the good stuff that God has accomplished and some yeah. some of the things God has accomplished He's accomplished in me and through mm. me, and for that I celebrate. And like Moses is able to say in Numbers chapter twelve yeah. that Moses is the most humble man in the world. <laughs> <It's> yeah. <laughs> on the face of the earth and and lots of people are like how can you know ah if he was truly humble he couldn't say he was humble no i, I don't think that's a correct view of humility like i, yeah. I think the truly sh humble person could recognize that they're humble and just say and they could they because their ego is not part of them anymore because it's a sort of objective view that yeah. they're taking and yeah. you need to sometimes be able to stand outside yourself and look at things yeah i mean i always think when you know so uh, one of my favorite buildings in the world, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral in mm -hmm. London, built by Sir Christopher Wren. And you just think, if someone had gone, uh, that is awesome. And he'd been like, that, oh my goodness. That Stop. is trash. <laughs> oh, I am so bad. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. goodness. I'm, the, oh, I'm like the worst cathedral. He probably builder. did because he was English. So he well, probably yeah, did do he that. Probably was just like, <laughs> just started saying, well, yeah, it's getting a bit chilly, though, isn't it? Mm. Anyone wants some tea? We're going to just uh, get to a couple more questions in a second. However, I mm. have realized that we haven't really done a bit of a push on the 3 2 1 course itself. <sighs> so here's a quick question, mm. Glenn. Mm. What is 3 2 1? 321 is life according to Jesus, and so uh, it exists in many different forms, and, and the book is one way that you can enjoy 321, but uh, we really want you to experience it in a multimedia way, and so you can go to 321course.com, and you can be taken through life according to Jesus. He's our tour guide, and over the course of eight sessions, you are shown who is Jesus, what is his picture of God, what is his picture of the world, what is his picture of you. Mm -hmm. And in these eight sessions, you're asked questions and you can um, think deeply and richly about these things. We've got some beautiful animations that help you to uh, imagine your way into the gospel stories. And uh, we put a lot of, of, of work and, and energy into this. And uh, well over a thousand people are on the platform right now. Well, I mean, not right now watching, but um, mm -hmm. th they have gone through the course. And uh, so it's a way of doing it online. 
and there are plenty of resources that you can check out at 321course.com. It's completely free. You just uh, type in your email address. It'll ask you for a password. Come up with a password and enter that in. We won't spam you. Uh, it's utterly free. There's no in-app purchases or anything like that. But there's, there's tons of, of material there. So go to 321course.com or you can do it in person. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had around 60 churches already do it since October. Um, and they, again, usually do it over four evenings. And uh, it's another way of, with others, exploring life according to Jesus. Very good. You answered that question incredibly well. Thank you. Do you get a book, by the way, for that? Do I get a book? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> for me. It's a book like well, no other. Like no other. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really is, if you... If you don't like computers and screens and stuff, mm. video, <laughs> then we put book those second videos best. <laughs> onto some pieces of paper and glued them together. Wow. We printed it out. We printed, we printed out, out our videos. the website. Yes. We printed out the uh, the course <laughs> and you've got it there. So, And mm. that goes, actually, if people are running in churches, yeah. we might have some church leaders on this uh, uh, live chat. Mm. Um they might want to buy this for people they're going to invite onto it. Yep. And they could buy 10 of these mm -hmm. from 10 of those. So there you go. Uh, right, we're going to do another question now. And this one, it's got so many thumbs up. Okay. Everyone wants this question. Hmm. Uh, and that's because it's probably the most typical question that comes up in these sort of grilled hmm. Christian type events uh, or ask anything. Uh, and it's from a uh, man named Martin. He says, uh, why does God make people suffer? Mm. I know a lot of my friends and family are suffering a lot. Hmm. I know a lot of my family and friends are, are suffering a lot too, uh, Martin. And it's and sometimes it goes in seasons, doesn't it? And sometimes it, it, it feels like it's one thing after another, after another, after another. And uh, the oldest book written down in the Bible is the book of Job. And... It is this story of Job is going along happily in the world, and then it's one thing after another, after another, after another. One servant comes and says, all your crops have been destroyed. Another servant says, all your livestock have been destroyed. Another servant says, your children are dead. And, and then he's struck mm -hmm. with boils. And it's just one thing after another. And that tends to be the way with suffering, doesn't it? And, and it's just so interesting that the, the oldest thing written down in the Bible is wrestling with that question, the suffering questions. That it's, it's the big one. And... I'm not going to be able to um, satisfyingly uh, answer that. But I think 3, 2, and 1 point to some truths that, that have really helped me in my suffering. And I think the, the first one is to think about 3 and to think about who God is. And according to Jesus, God is a Father who has always been loving His Son Jesus in the joy of the Holy Spirit, which means that in the beginning there was not suffering, in the beginning there was love, and God is compassion. God is mercy. God, God is one who wants our best. He really, he really is love. And at that point, that makes the suffering question harder. Mm -hmm. And in, in a sense, with suffering, you know, my goal is never to explain suffering as though, as though I could you know, tell you something in the next five minutes and you go, oh, right, well, that makes sense then, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. That, that would be a very unsatisfying answer, wouldn't it? Um, in a sense... What Christianity does is it allows you to have a problem with suffering. Mm -hmm. Because if God wasn't so good, we would still be in pain, but we wouldn't be shaking our fists and we wouldn't be expecting anything different. You know, if right. if it wasn't for the utter goodness of God, then the the evil and suffering of this world wouldn't strike us as outrageous. Mm -hmm. Because I can see, like, you can do that with, with the evil question quite e quite yeah. straightforwardly. So if there's, you know, stuff that is evil in the world where we need to have something, you know, to be able to call it properly evil, otherwise it just becomes this kind of relativized mush of different things that different people like or don't like. On the on the suffering question, how does that sort of... Is it is it that... It's kind of what's the opposite of suffering? Mm. Is it bliss bliss or joy or, or whatever it would be and that yeah. that is part of who god is in the first place so that distinction between the bliss and the 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 blessedness yeah yeah the joy the yeah. yeah okay yeah i was preaching last night on um 
there's a verse in Luke chapter 10, verse 21, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, prays, Father, you know. And so if that's, that's who God is, the joy of the Holy Spirit filling a son who says, Father, mm-hmm. filling the Father who says, my beloved boy, that, that, is, that is the goodness of God that actually makes the problem of evil a problem and the problem mm-hmm. of suffering a problem. Um, and so then you think, think well, where, where has it come from? Well, this God of love has made a world that is not himself, right? And if it's not himself and he is good, then there's, there's actually something about the world that's, that's going to go through a process of being not good. Mm-hmm. Almost by the nature of the case, if he is light... And he's not just going to extrude a part of himself in, into reality, but actually grant a distinct existence to this other thing called the world. Then there's going to be a darkness there. It's a darkness that he will want to overcome with his light. Mm-hmm. But almost in in the creation of the world, there is almost a, there is almost an inevitability about you know that 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 kind of journey that creation will have to go through. That doesn't mean humanity has to fall. That doesn't doesn't mean sin has to happen. But there does almost have to be a journey in which there is something that is different from God that is then uh, redeemed by God, that is then um, reconciled, or that, that is then reclaimed. Brought. Reclaimed. reclaimed that's, yeah, that's, that's nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so the story of the two is is the story of well, humanity um, didn't just exist um, as as distinct from God, but actually turned from God, mm-hmm. and we have wanted to go our own way. And if you want to go a different way to the way of light, then you're going to go into darkness. If you want to go a different way from life, you're going to go into death. And if you want to go a different way from yeah. love, you're going to go into disconnection. And there we are in darkness, death, and disconnection. And, and so the Bible does say, you know, part of the problem of, of suffering and evil is me. You know, mm-hmm. I'm the sort of person who actually makes things worse. You know, I'm, I'm the sort of person who doesn't make things better, but actually makes things worse. And I'm caught up in a, in a problem of suffering. And then the good news is, well, what does love do when love sees the beloved in trouble? Love comes and, and, and reclaims and reconciles and redeems and joins us in that suffering. And, and you know, the, 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 the question most literally um, was asked, you know, why does God make us suffer? And what's really a stark truth is, is in Isaiah chapter 53, it was the Lord's will to crush him. It was the Lord's will to crush Christ, mm-hmm. right? That... Somehow, in the in the wisdom of God, that the journey down into suffering and then up into resurrection is at the heart of God's glory, is at the heart mm-hmm. of, of, of who this God is. And that's, that's a massive truth to wrap your head around, and it's, yeah. it's, it's not something that I like fully understand. But there is, there is the journey that we have walked away from God. God has come to us to take our suffering on himself and rise again. And then the, the truth of one is, well, we were born one with Adam. We can be one with Jesus and share in his future, a future that is without suffering and a future that, that, that goes on forever. And, and our hearts crave that. Our hearts, we, we mm-hmm. want the time of shadow to be over. We want to step out, you know, into the light. And, and if you walk away from Jesus... That doesn't help you with suffering. You know, all of a sudden you're suffering now without him mm-hmm. and without hope. With him, it doesn't solve all the questions about why did this happen now and why did that happen to that person in that way. I don't think we'll know that this side of heaven. Mm-hmm. But we get his presence with us through the suffering and we get the promise of a, a world without that that suffering. And, and I think trying to do suffering <laughs> is it's hard enough, but trying to do it without him is is too hard. So, mm-hmm. and because in a way, outside of Christ, what hope is there that suffering can ever be resolved? Right. That 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 blessedness might be next. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, and so there's that great verse about you know who for the joy set before him. Mm. Um, went to the cross and mm. you think well that it's it's a through suffering mm. it's a through death yes. story it's a through the darkness back into like there is light at the end of the tunnel yes. the light at the end of this tunnel yes um within a christian perspective 
Mm. And I, in many ways, the you know the God of all comfort, who mm. you know can comfort us because He Himself has mm. suffered. Yeah, um, and that doesn't. Yeah, it, it it's not a oh learn that one single fact and then you'll never yeah. suffer again. Or if you are suffering, you'll yeah. never really struggle with it because. Yeah. We do often. And that's what's interesting about Job is Job asks 20 times. So he's mm. praying to the Lord and he's crying out and he asks 20 times why and he never gets an answer. <clears throat> he does get an experience of God at the end of the book and he does get a happily ever after, but he never gets a, an answer. And, and in a sense, like you're reading the book and you, you kind of, <clears throat> if you've read chapter one, you kind of know in one sense why mm-hmm. he's suffering. But if he was told chapter one during his suffering, it wouldn't really have helped him that much and we always we always feel like oh if i could just get an answer to the question why that would help i'm not sure that's true Mm -hmm. i think what we need is christ in the midst of it and hope for beyond it the calculus of why did this happen and when and for you know for what purpose um we ser- it's really understandable of course we yeah. cry out why just just as job did it doesn't actually help us the way we think it might help us what we really need is jesus himself in the midst mm-hmm. of the valley in the valley of the shadow of death yeah t- to bring us through and that's 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 what i I'd, I'd, I'd pray for you martin that that you and and your family would mm. would less know like reasons and more know christ himself in mm-hmm. the middle of it Mm. That's um, very helpful. The next question is is uh, I'm going to put up is a it's been upvoted several times, but it's it's by anonymous. So if this is your question, then um, and you know you would like to have a copy of three two one, uh, so that you sorry how to see life a guide in three two one, um, then please do uh, pass along your email address uh well your postal address for us by contacting info at speaklife.org.uk so here's the question um would sin be forgiven for a child murderer or a pedophile surely this is pure evil Mm. i think everyone can agree this is pure evil and so let's let's start with the end of the question uh, you know, C.S. Lewis, the author of the Narnia Chronicles, he, he went on this journey from atheist to theist, meaning believer in, in God. So he went from not believing in God to believing in God and then to Christian. And the thing that turned him from not being a believer in God to believing in some kind of God was this idea of pure evil. And he said, well, what am I calling evil if there is not good? And if I want to call something pure evil, then surely I'm by implication saying that there's something that is capital G good. If there's mm-hmm. a capital E evil, there's a capital G good. And he used the illustration of, you know, if if there's never been anything such thing as a straight line, then you could never call a line crooked either. Mm-hmm. Um, lines would just be like, if there was no such thing as a straight line, lines would just be lines. It would all just be a mess. And you wouldn't expect it to be anything other than a mess if there wasn't such a thing as a straight line. And if there wasn't such a thing as pure good then we wouldn't expect anything else in the world and we wouldn't call pure evil evil. Mm. It would just be the way things are if there wasn't such a thing as pure good. (laughs) That took him to a belief that there is a capital G good. There is God. Now, therefore, if we are looking at something like child murder and and pedophilia and we are calling it pure evil, we are saying there is something uh, something that is good could that good God forgive a perpetrator of such pure evil? And the the Christian answer is, well, if God cannot forgive that evil, what hope do we have for the other evils that you and I perpetrate? Mm -hmm. And, And have I committed child murder or pedophilia? No. But by comparison with the capital G good God, um, do I also need forgiveness? Yeah, I I 100% need forgiveness. I'm banking on forgiveness because I am crooked in my own way. Maybe not in this way, 
but in my own way, I am crooked mm-hmm. and absolutely need forgiveness. And that's the, the other interesting thing about this question. Forgiveness does not imply that a sin is not so bad after all. Mm-hmm. And again, C.S. Lewis said this, for, you know, forgiveness actually implies that the sin was so terrible, there was nothing else for it but for it to be forgiven. Mm-hmm. It could not be just. So can pedophilia be justified? Never. Mm-hmm. Right. Can can child murder be justified? Can it can it can it be um, just forgotten? Right? Can can it be accepted? Can child murder be accepted? Never. Can pedophilia be accepted? Never. Can it be forgiven? It must be forgiven because it's evil. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, the question asks us to put ourselves into the, sh- you know, to imagine the person who is the child murderer or the pedophile, somehow making some confession and saying, I'm sorry, God, and then getting, you know, accepted into the, the, the pearly gates of, of, of heaven. And that, that is a difficult thing for, for all of us to kind of grasp hold of. But I would, I would urge anonymous to read another CS Lewis book called the great divorce, where he talks about this, this story of, it's a fictional story. This is not how C.S. Lewis thinks the afterlife works. But he says, imagine if a busload of ghosts from hell are taking a day trip to heaven and the bright men of heaven are inviting them in and saying, please come. And he's got this conversation there where there is a murderer and the murderer is in hell, but the bright man from heaven is inviting him in. And um, uh, sorry, so the, the, the child murderer is the bright man. Um, actually, who is in heaven. And there is someone who has not committed murder, who is the, the, the ghost from hell. And he is outraged that the, that the murderer is in heaven and that he's, mm-hmm. and that he's been left um, in hell. And, the, and the, the bright man, the murderer, says, I don't know how it works, but just come. And then the, the murderer says, I don't want anyone's bleeding charity. And the murderer who's been forgiven (laughs) says, oh, then do ask for the bleeding charity. Um, This is the only basis on which anyone is ever Mm -hmm. like invited into, into heaven. And in the scene, the, the man from hell kind of curses the, the murderer and, and slinks off back, back down to where he Mm -hmm. came from. And it's, it's a very psychologically believable scenario, actually, where the murderer has has shown true contrition and there has been something of a reconciliation and it's in the it's in the hands of God and you can sort of you can sort of even though in the abstract I can't picture the child murdering pedophile being transformed, C. S. Lewis does a great job of, of, of portraying how that might happen. He also does a great job of portraying how regular sinners like you and me can harden ourselves and justify ourselves so much that we turn our back on the bleeding mercy yeah. and the bleeding charity and and curve ourselves in on ourselves. And so I, I don't have a great answer for this question. I, th- I think any sin can be forgiven. I really do. Um, and I'm banking that every sin I've committed will mm-hmm. be forgiven in Jesus. And... The alternative is to think of a God who kind of has a certain bar that you've got to meet. Yep. And I'm just not, not sure I could ever be sure that I've met that bar. So I'm, I'm glad that he sets the bar way down in the gutter and offers it for free. Mm. And that it's by grace you have been saved. And just if it's yeah. by grace, then it, it can't be by um, works or, or mm. failing to commit certain sins. Mm. Um I want to move to a couple of questions now, which are around the same sort of thing, mm-hmm. uh, which is to do with, I'm just going to mark that on there, uh, which is to do with kind of this, I suppose it's like this kind of meaning crisis conversation. Mm. Lots of what we do on this uh, YouTube channel in mm. terms of engaging with people who are really thinking through um, big ideas. Um, I'm going to start with, this one by Aristotle Jedi. Mm, great name. Hello, Aristotle. Um, although the way that works, it's a bit like rainy days and Mondays. 
Aristotle Jedi always gets me down. You know, when these certain phrases, just because of the number of syllables, yeah, yeah, the arrangement, just yeah, like Bethany Rigby. <laughs> be I mean, you don't even need to go <laughs> I on. Know, it's, it's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. she's got the same Einstein last name. News, yeah. Um, okay, here's Aristotle Jedi's question. Given Justin Brierley's, mm. uh, not of this parish, but good friends, mm. uh, given Justin Brierley's recent book, do you think the current crop of people sympathetic to Christianity are more on the conservative side of things? Does this affect apologetics? So Justin Briley's recent book is The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a brilliant book, and, and um, I've commended it. I haven't said that it's, there's no other book. It's like no it. block party for the soul or anything, <laughs> but it's all right. It's more a cheese yeah. and wine party. It's so. but, um, <laughs> which is fine. Um, his podcast is, is fa fascinating and yeah. it's going from strength to strength. And he's, he's noticing lots of different people. Are they more on the conservative side of things? Interestingly, I was on his podcast with Elizabeth Oldfield from the Theos Think Tank. And she's noticing a lot of the same stuff in that space of the meaning crisis. But mm -hmm. she's noticing a lot of people actually on the left of things and, and a, lot of people on the, a lot of people who are environmentalists, for mm -hmm. instance, um, who are coming to see like Paul Kingsnorth has come to see that there is a deeper issue going on than sustainability right mm -hmm. as, as though oh no the you know nature is in crisis what we really need to do is make sure we can keep our late modern capitalistic society show yeah. on the road <laughs> yeah and figuring out oh it's actually a um, spiritual problem and not just an economic or technical problem to solve and Paul Kingsnorth that that um, thought has sort of led him very deeply into Orthodox Christianity, um, coming very much um, from the left. And Elizabeth Oldfield, a lot of the people that she she's got a kind of like a Christian commune, Christian community, really. Yeah. Um, and is noticing a lot of people on the left coming coming to to faith or to start to consider Jesus from that side of things. Um, so I, I I could name a number of different people. Um, some of them might be more right-leaning. Some of them might be more left-leaning. I would say there's been quite an overreach on the progressive left um, that has caused a kickback, and so you get your Constantine Kissens and your trigonometry people. Yeah. But the far right surely has been been active too, right? The far right it's, has been uh, active too. Um, but that they've been very, uh, very explicitly, you know, non-christian you, know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know if you're thinking about the the um the marches through virginia and whatever mm -hmm. the proud boys and and, yeah. and that kind of stuff um i suppose it wasn't with those things it wasn't quite so much in terms of an intellectual hmm. it wasn't part of the you know the the, the chatterati it wasn't mm. all these people yep. kind of engaged in these deep kind of fundamental questions yeah it was a bit more sort of just mm. disgruntlement and well, yeah and violence and, and that sort of stuff which yeah. of course on the on the far left with the you know the mm. rioting and, and 2020 and things and like that stuff, yeah um but uh, but I, th I think the campus stuff um especially from sort of 2014 2015 onwards um was sort of brought to light and absolutely figures on the right with kind of shining a spotlight on the craziness and it's yeah. and it's happened you know very recently claudine gay you know the, the whole plagiarism thing was because people oh, the on the right the harvard president the harvard who president who has just recently resigned after it was revealed that there was a whole bunch of plagiarism and you know they say well they were shining the plagiarism spotlight on her for political reasons and they're like well yes <laughs> And she was guilty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. Um, and so there has been that dynamic of, of sort of figures on the right kind of really shining a spotlight on some of the craziness on mm -hmm. the left, you know, on on campuses. And and I think it that that craziness, like Evergreen, like that that place in oh, Washington the college State and near the Seattle. They sort of turned the whole thing upside down. Didn't yeah, they? Brett was, Weinstein uh, wrote a, an email, and it turned into a like a absolute farce. Like um, 
and and I think that has woken up a lot of people, like the Brett Weinstein's of this world. They've woken. They have woke. They have awoken to the <laughs> right. woke. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. There's and been a, an awakening. Yes. Of a lot of people. And there's been yeah. a backlash yeah. to woke stuff, and then and then they just become anti woke, and and then it's then it becomes a kind of a battle between the woke and the anti woke. But I'm very um, pleased that people like Constantine Kissin are, are kind of getting sick of. <coughs> I'm sick of just bashing the woke. Right? Mm -hmm. And there's got to be something that goes deeper than woke or anti woke. And his next book is on gratitude. And mm. you know, like, well, who are you thinking? Who he, are wants you he wants he to be Mister Thankful. He wants to be Mister Thankful. Yeah, okay, that's a speed like video, by the way. Just uh, mm. you can check. I'm it sure out. they know, but yeah, yeah. If no anyone doubt. hasn't seen it yet, you can watch <laughs> it on this channel. So, like, is it all on the right or or people? I think of a Louise Perry. Um, you know, a, a writer for the New Statesman who is now much more comfortable, or, or rather the Telegraph and the Daily Mail are much more comfortable employing her than the New Statesman were. She's based. She has become based. Right. Properly based. So th there is that journey, but then mm. there's Hulk Hogan, isn't there? And uh, who knows where he is politically. <laughs> who saw that <laughs> little side shift from little Louise Perry, sweet yeah. Louise Perry, to the Hulkster brother. I can't wait to see this on the uh, Justin Bradley podcast. <laughs> so what's the Hulkster done? He's got, He's got himself baptized. baptized. He? He's got, yeah. like, I, I don't know the story behind it, but like he, he seems to be going hard for Jesus right now. I don't know what the story is behind it's that. It's so tricky because, of course, his, just on a little professional wrestling thing from the 80s and 90s, his whole thing was he was the real American, and mm. so it was all about say your prayers, eat your vitamins, yeah, and yeah. all this sort of stuff. So the whole God thing was right there. And, you yeah, know, yeah. So... It's interesting to see, and I have not, mm. I did get sent a WhatsApp message about the Hulkster's baptism mm. and was excited for it. But um, yeah, in, in for so many people, they're so steeped in so much Christianity anyway. Yeah. We might even say it's the air they breathe mm. that we are likely to look in a Christian direction yeah. when we realize that the bottom has just fallen out of our yeah. worldview yeah. and we need somewhere somewhere to go one thing I'll, I'll say that's a bit crunchier um to to aristotle jedi's question is that i think i think 10 years ago if i was invited onto a uk university campus and given a question either about the environment let's say or or the sexual revolution or things like that mm -hmm. i th i think i would have probably tried to appeal to just the soft left liberal sensibilities mm -hmm. of the room and hey jesus is an environmentalist too or whatever okay right or, or yeah <clears throat> i would not have gone in on the, the sexual revolution with louise perry's book right. and said it's big been a big mistake isn't it <laughs> right right um i, I and so it, i i think well that see that's really yeah. interesting because is it that the there were voices within the church who were doing apologetics, who were doing those lunch bar talks on, on university campuses and everything else. Is it that there were a whole bunch of people who were saying what people like Louise Perry were saying in terms of the sexual revolution? And so that holding to a Christian sexual ethic was something that definitely was happening? Mm. Or was it that where there was a bit of soft peddling of the, the call to Christian discipleship and the call to the beauty of the Christian sexual ethic, which then needed a bit of a kick up the backside from effectively a voice from without outside the church, mm. even if she is kind of quite Christian adjacent in yeah. lots of ways now. Yeah, it it certainly does strengthen our arm, I think, mm -hmm. to, to have other people and to have you know to have J.K. Rowling's and, and people mm -hmm. you know saying saying certain things, and um, it it certainly helps when non Christians have a courage that sometimes Christians haven't. I, I think there's a whole bunch of Christians who have been very courageous on a whole bunch of issues and, and have held a, a faithful line mm -hmm. for ages. And, and in a sense, it's harder for Christians because people just roll their eyes at Christians when they... When they if a Christian writes the case against the sexual revolution, like big right. yawn, right? <laughs> like okay. Nobody takes notice. Um, but Louise Perry writes for the New Statesman and, yeah. and suddenly... <gasps> It's, you know, um, so it, in one sense, it's easier for, yeah. for non-Christians to, to say these sorts of things. 
Um, but in another sense, there there has been courage shown by a lot of these people um, yeah. that is a rebuke, I think, sometimes to Christians mm. and and an encouragement for for us to to be sure of our guns. And there there are people who are saying things on some of these issues, and they're they're just so yeah, they're ju- they're just so sure that when other people are saying you're harming X Y and Z, you know, members of the population, you're erasing their existence. Mm-hmm. And they're just like, no, no, I, I'm very, I'm very clear. I'm protecting women's rights or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and on they go. And there's, there's, yeah, there definitely has been a courage shown by, by certain people that Christians can learn from. Yeah. Mm. Uh, let's move on to a similar sort of question. Again, this is from Anonymous. Uh, maybe it's the same Anonymous as before. Maybe it's a new Anonymous Either way, uh, if you would like to get hold of your free copy of How to See Life for Garden 321, uh, please send your uh, name and address to the info at Speak Life with the question that you had read out. Here is that question. Stop waffling, Nate. If you had were talking to a pretty progressive liberal... How pretty? <laughs> what intellectual slash imaginative slash narrative apologetics would mm. you use? Ditto for a conservative. I would write the air we breathe. Okay. Essentially. Another book advert. I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> Promoting one book isn't enough tonight. <laughs> <laughs> there is something about saying, look, um, you already believe in human rights, let's say. And I think you probably believe in human rights more than you believe that this is a godless universe, right? I, I you know, mm-hmm. my, my friends who absolutely believe in the inviolable worth and dignity of all people, that you shouldn't, you know, tread down the weak. They believe in that far more. They are certain of that. Far more than they are certain that this is an absolutely godless, naturalistic universe. Mm-hmm. They are mm-hmm. so much oh, yeah. more sure. Otherwise, they couldn't claim the title of pretty progressive right. liberal or well, exactly. conservative. What yeah. are you, you know, what are you conserving that point? Yeah, and yeah, and why believe in progress and all, all that? And and so, um, I have found it useful um, to talk about all people as believers. That those beliefs are not obvious, natural, universal. They are not the result of science, logic, mathematics. They are beliefs. They are beyond reason in 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 that sense and they have a christian pet pedigree to them and if you pull at the threads of these you will find something incredibly jesusy at the mm-hmm. other end of it so um for the pretty progressive liberal person i would do that kind of thing ditto for a conservative um well ag- again what what are you trying to conserve mm-hmm. and the the liberal and the conservative are existing within the world that Jesus has built, and we're all just hurling Bible verses at each other. We've just forgotten the references, and the progressive is is hurling certain Bible verses, and the conservative is hurling different verses, perhaps back. But I think what the church is always trying to do is to conserve the Jesus revolution mm-hmm. and to continually get back to Jesus in his revolutionary ways. And as we continually get back to Jesus, he actually drives us forwards for his vision mm-hmm. for, for humanity. So if you want to be conservative, well, why, why don't you actually go back to the force, the movement, the revolution that has built your world? And again, um, I would, yeah, take them to the Jesus revolution. And on those Bible verses that people are hurling, Hmm. is there a point at which those Bible verses haven't been sufficiently understood as Christian Hmm. Bible verses so that they've been removed from their Christian context? Completely. And therefore, they don't actually make an awful lot of sense together. Whereas once you've got Jesus as the one, you know, uh, who is the Word of God, yeah. Then the Bible verses make sense in so far as they are understood. Yeah. In relation to him or Yeah. And so much of the madness of the post-Christian world is because we have detached the, the values from the scriptures and distorted them. And mm-hmm. so instead of having the image of God, right, which is the the biblical phrase from Genesis chapter 1, instead we have human rights. And then we just go to town on human rights and 
of course, we're all now noticing that, like, yeah. as these atomized individuals all thumping our chests saying, I've got my rights, you know, I've got a right to Wi-Fi, I've got a right to everything. It's like, what are you talking mm -hmm. about? It becomes entirely detached from sanity when you detach it from the scriptures. And, and so a return to the scriptures that actually gave rise to what human rights are actually describing um, is, is what will help people who are recognizing that like rights detached from responsibilities just end up with chaos or, yeah. you know, there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, for we are all one in Christ Jesus is the biblical verse. And that gets detached. And it's just like, for we are all interchangeable individuals, <laughs> like in the collective. Meet Lego Gnosticism. We are meet Lego Gnostics. Yes. Thank cool. you, Mary Harrington. Mary yeah. Harrington. Um, right. I'm going to move to a, again, a similar sort of question. Uh, and this one is uh, from Isaac Simmons. Mm -hmm. Pin this one. Uh, Isaac says, uh, with new atheism declining, should Christian apologetics now focus more on Islam, considering its growing Western and global influence? 1,000%, and we should have been doing it throughout the noughties and 2010s too. Okay. Um, because a atheism was shrinking all throughout those years as well, globally speaking, you know. And they, atheists don't have kids as well. Well, exactly, yeah. So the, don't prepare to argue with them. Yeah. There won't be any left. It's I, I, crazy. I mean, everyone in the West has a, a crazy I know love. some atheists do have children, <laughs> so just to qualify that. And some atheists love their children too, <laughs> as Sting might have sung. I have been told. But, yeah, um, yeah I mean, the... Um, uh, yeah, so the, the new atheism is absolutely... Um, declining, and I think Justin Briley's book does a great way of uh, does a great job of of mm -hmm. describing that and showing how that is. But I think it's always the case that we should have Islam on our radar. Um, I mean, for one for one reason out of many, I I think Islam is basically a seventh century Christian heresy, and the New Atheism was basically a seventeenth century Christian heresy, mm -hmm. um, because everything's Christian. Here we <laughs> breathe, right? But when you are talking to a Muslim, actually, um, you're going to end up talking about who is God, what is the word of God, what is salvation, who is Jesus, did he die on the cross, is he the son of God? Um, it's going to be talking about some amazingly like, weighty matters, mm -hmm. interesting matters, matters right at the heart of three, two, and one, right? Yeah. When you're talking to your average atheist secular person nowadays um you might end up talking about anything right mm -hmm. when you're when you're when you're engaged in muslim apologetics and when you're engaged in in just understanding islam from the inside and 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 talking with muslim neighbors and friends you you really get much more of a pepsi challenge taste and see the difference like when you're yeah. like when i when i talk to a, a, a a Muslim for, for ages about like who is Jesus and, and why my Muslim friend doesn't think he dies on the cross and why I think it's so vital to yeah. believe that he does. I go away like admiring the glory of the crucified Christ so much. Yeah. When yeah, I speak yeah. to, to Muslims. So just for that reason I think um we we need to be yeah. doing that. But but for demographic reasons as well. Yeah. <laughs> um Let's do, uh, there was a question down here that is, I'm just going to sort of try and wrap up this little sort of section. Apologies if you're asking questions uh, around this sort of thing. Do we have a, a cutoff time? A cutoff time, I think we're going to say uh, 9.20. I'm okay, going to 9.20. There was a 9.15 thing. We've got a couple more questions. Be and generous. A few okay. Do. So 9.20. I'm Isaac gonna, gets a book. Well done, Isaac. Well done. And we come to... Mm. Julia. So this is sort of uh, finishing off this sort of conversation around, um, well, hopefully around apologetics. Uh, Julia says, have you explored the impact of other faiths and beliefs around the world to know that Christianity is as truly exceptional in, for example, protection of the weak than claimed in the air we breathe? Mm. It's a very good question. Uh, I should clarify that what I'm not saying in the air we breathe is that other cultures cannot care for the weak or cannot put 
Westerners to shame in the ways mm. that they they care for the weak and certainly the strength the strength of families in non-western cultures when compared to atomized mm-hmm. jaded westerners absolutely puts us uh, to shame and i'm not saying that only christianity has produced protections for the weak around the world and down through history i guess what i am saying is when we look around the world at admirable traits in other cultures it's interesting that we identify protection of the weak as one of the first things. Hmm. We don't think to ourselves, oh, gosh, the, the Vikings, their cruelty. Something mm-hmm. to behold, isn't it? You know, mm. they, like, they, they really do, did know how to pillage, didn't they? <laughs> you know, like we, don't, the, yeah. we don't admire that kind of glory <laughs> yeah. that the Vikings <clears throat> sort of had, but we do admire compassion as... Uh, Buddhists kind of speak of, or mm-hmm. we, we do admire the Ummah, the, the brotherhood of Muslims around the world and, and, and the way they kind of look out for one another. So, so my claim is not that other cultures do not or cannot protect the weak or that Christianity is necessarily best, but I, but I do want us to notice that we think of those things as ultimate and we judge other cultures according to whether they are compassionate enough. Mm-hmm. And when I, what's interesting about it is when I talk about um, other cultures might not consider compassion in the same way that we do, people will instantly say, oh, but other cultures are moral. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, no, they are moral. Mm-hmm. But not everyone's conception of moral morality is yeah, identical. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so what, what, what have I looked at? In particular, I've looked at Islam and I've looked a little bit at Buddhism in, in terms of those worldviews and, and of course, you know, atheism and the way it's sort of worked itself out. Um, and in particular, the, the, the particular area in Buddhism is that area of compassion um, because, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, mm-hmm. a, um, it's a big concept within Buddhism, but so is attachment and the dangers of attachment such that there's, there's lively debate within Buddhism about you know, how do you balance compassion yeah. with attachment? You don't want to get attached, but you do want to be compassionate. Um, and I think, from a distance, um, the reasons why the compassion revolution type aspects of medieval Christendom and how it sort of played itself out in hospitals and hospices and um, orphan care and that sort of thing... Um, the, the reason why it played out in the way that it did is because attachment and suffering, mm-hmm. redemptive suffering, is a massive deal for Christians. Right. In a, in a way that it is not for, yeah. for Buddhists. That, that actually jumping in with both feet the way that Jesus did, the second Adam, yeah. who dived down into our pit and mess and suffered and voluntarily embraced that, uh, that attachment mm-hmm. that entailed suffering... Um, that that is the definition of his kind of compassion. Yeah, I think that births a different brand of compassion. Interesting to what is in in, in Buddhism. Um, but a, as I say, I- Islam probably is the the, the religion that I, I know <laughs> best, um, other than Christianity. And yeah, I, I would I would a- absolutely say that it, that again, because of Islam's conception of. Allah has no partners, and to associate partners with Allah is shirk, and it's it's the sin of all sins. Um, Allah does not descend to the earth, let alone to the cross. Um, and He is the compassionate, the merciful one, you mm-hmm. know. And and you know, it, part of the names, the ninety nine names of of Allah, is, is always about His compassion. But in in dialogue with a, a an imam on Justin Briley's um, unbelievable show, I. Um, I actually asked the imam, like, what concrete example of compassion has Allah, like, shown? And interestingly, his example was that um, Allah revealed to Muhammad that he could relax the divorce laws for a certain woman um, whose husband was was doing her out of, like, um, her estate. And that was the compassionate thing that Allah had done. He relaxed a certain divorce law so that one woman could um, could have the estate that was was left to her, you know, through her divorce. 
Now compare that with the compassion. Yes, it's, it's quite the sitcom episode, isn't it? Um, the yeah, I you know, and that's a that is fascinating because right, I've not done a huge amount in comparative religions, but in terms of uh, mythologies and what is the story that's mm. at the heart of it, mm. and of course Christianity is is the myth that became fact, the myth that yeah. is fact, the true myth, which is true history is of the dying and rising God mm -hmm. as the great salvific act, the great way right. in which people are saved. And so it's interesting that on that, you know, clearly there's a conversation to be had about, mm -hmm. okay, what system would you like to uh, put into play mm -hmm. um, to protect the weak? Yeah. What philosophical system or theological framework would you like to use that you think will have the greatest outcome for people, you know, will be the best one to use? Uh, but it is interesting that the, the Christian one is not just based upon, oh, this might work best. Yeah. There's no, this is the right. one that God has done. This, this is the one that's the, actually the happened. action that has yeah. occurred. And yeah. and I, I don't think I can be contradicted in saying that the story of compassion at the heart of Scripture is unimprovable, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> like, because yeah. yeah, you yeah. could not have a higher <laughs> figure descend to a deeper depth mm -hmm. in order to have compassion on a greater number of people for a greater duration of time. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. How wide and long and high yeah. and deep is the love of Christ, says Ephesians 3. And I don't think that can be contradicted. Um, there, there will be much more compassionate B Buddhists and Muslims and Hindus yeah. in the world, much more than me. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that the story of compassion that Jesus tells is a story in which a Samaritan is the hero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the person who is not the Bible guy. Yeah. The person who is not the priest or the yeah. Levite. It's the guy who is the other religion. And so right at the heart of our story of com compassion is not that only Bible people can be compassionate. Mm -hmm. And this is not rah, rah, yay Christians. Um, but I do think the story of the Good Samaritan, the ultimate Good Samaritan, who actually descended all the way down to to our level in order to save us and redeem us and to go to hell and back for us mm -hmm. is a story of con compassion that <clears throat> not only hasn't been superseded or surpassed, it can't be surpassed. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you, it's an, it's an unimprovable story yeah. of compassion. Christians, are, are, you know, whether, whether we're very good at living it out or not is a, dif a different question. The answer to that is it's a mixed report, but mm -hmm. the story itself is the ultimate story of compassion. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a great way, I think, to, to sort of wrap uh, this up. I would say um, that many of the things that have been discussed already uh, this evening in terms of the answers uh, Glenn has given are available in this book, if you prefer reading to watching or listening. Uh, that is How to See Life, A Guide in 321. It is now available. This is the launch party. Woohoo! It's launched. Uh, go to that ten was a of those. Block party for the block party. <laughs> it was. In fact, have a block party when you get hold of the book, and then send your Take photographs to at Glenn Scrivener and uh, what's yeah. what's Karen Swallow Prize Twitter. Twitter. KS Prior. She needs to be At tagged in even more stuff to do with <laughs> Glenn and Sweet Life. Uh, but the other way to uh, engage with this uh, sort of material, the other way to, if you like, put on the Jesus spectacles mm. and to see the world, to see God, to see yourself the way Jesus sees uh, God, the world, and yourself, uh, would be to go to 321course.com. Uh, you click on a button, put in your email address, uh, pick yourself a, a password. And there you go. All the goodies are available there. All uh, all the sessions you can be part of. There is a Discord uh, community that Speak Life uh, runs. You can get hold of that if you go through 321course.com. The other way that you can get hold of that is by clicking in the link in the description, what do we call box. That? description box, the big gray thing underneath this box here. So um, you can discover... Life According to Jesus on 321course.com. You can join our online community on uh, Discord. Uh, you can also go to 321, uh, sorry, www.speaklife.org.uk forward slash give if you would like to join the Discord there. And if you'd like to become a regular donor to Speak Life, we would be very appreciative. Mm. We'd be almost as thankful as Constantine Kissin is about to be mm. when his book about gratitude goes out. And I'm sure we'll be chatting to him about that book mm, when like it that. does. Yeah. 
very much. Um, okay, I think that's about all we've got time for. Thank you very much, Glenn Scriven. Thank you, Nate. It's been fun. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. How many to questions ask have we you anything? answered? Do we, I does think we know? got through Don't about. Know. I think it was about eight, nine, uh, ten. I think it was like ten or eleven. Hey, awesome. Good job, everybody. Which is way more than we normally get through in a conversation. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm uh, reform mythologist Nate Morgan Locke. He is Glenn Scrivener. We are very glad you were here. See ya.